The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Chapter 2 Saturday morning was come, and all the summer world was bright and fresh and brimming with life. There was a song in every heart, and if the heart was young, the music issued at the lips. There was cheer in every face, and a spring in every step. The locust trees were in bloom, and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hill, beyond the village and above it, was green with vegetation and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, reposeful, and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence, and all gladness left him, and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Thirty yards of board fence nine feet high. Life to him seemed hollow, an existence but a burden. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank, repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed street with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence, and sat down on a tree box, discouraged. Jim came skipping out at the gate with a tin pail and singing Buffalo Gals. Bringing water from the town pump had always been hateful work in Tom's eyes before but now it did not strike him so. He remembered that there was company at the pump. White, mulatto, and negro boys and girls were always there waiting their turns, resting, trading playthings, quarreling, fighting, skylarking. And he remembered that, although the pump was only a hundred and fifty yards off, Jim never got back with a bucket of water under an hour, and even then somebody generally had to go after him. Tom said, Say, Jim, I'll fetch the water if you whitewash some. Jim shook his head and said, Can't, Mars Tom. Oh, missus, she told me I got to go and get this water and not stop fooling round with anybody. She say she speck Mars Tom gwine to ax me to whitewash, and so she told me to go long and tend to my own business. She load she'd tend to do the whitewashing. Oh, never you mind what she said, Jim. That's the way she always talks. Give me the bucket. I won't be gone only a, a minute. She won't ever know. Oh, I dasn't, Mars Tom. Old missus, she'd take and tar the head off at me. Deed she would. She, she never licks anybody. Wax him over the head with her thimble. And who cares for that, I'd like to know. She talks awful, but talk don't hurt. Anyways, it don't if she don't cry. Jim, I'll give you a marble. I'll give you a white alley. Jim began to waver. White alley, Jim, and it's a bully taw. My, that's a mighty gay marvel, I tell you. But Mars Tom, I's powerful afraid old missus, and besides, if you will, I'll show you my sore toe. Jim was only human. This attraction was too much for him. He put down his pail, took the white alley, and bent over the toe with absorbing interest while the bandage was being unwound. In another moment, he was flying down the street, with his pail and a tingling rare, Tom was whitewashing with vigor, and Aunt Polly was retiring from the field with a slipper in her hand and triumph in her eye. But Tom's energy did not last. He began to think of the fun he had planned for this day, and his sorrows multiplied. Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions, and they would make a world of fun of him for having to work. The very thought of it burned him like fire. He got out his worldly wealth and examined it, bits of toys, marbles, and trash, enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not half enough to buy so much as half an hour of pure freedom. So he returned his straightened means to his pocket and gave up the idea of trying to buy the boys. At this dark and hopeless moment an inspiration burst upon him, nothing less than a great, magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. Ben Rogers hove in sight presently, the very boy of all boys whose ridicule he had been dreading. Ben's gait was to hop, skip, and jump, proof enough that his heart was light and his anticipations high. He was eating an apple and giving a long, melodious whoop, at intervals followed by a deep-toned ding-dong-dong, ding-dong-dong, for he was personating a steamboat. As he drew near, he slackened speed, took the middle of the street, leaned far over to starboard and rounded to ponderously and with laborious pomp and circumstance. 
for he was personating the big Missouri and considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bills combined, so he had to imagine himself standing on his own hurricane deck, giving the orders and executing them. Stop her, sir! ting ling ling The headway ran almost out, and he drew up slowly toward the sidewalk. Ship up to back! ting ling ling His arms straightened and stiffened down his sides. Set her back on the stabboard! ting ling ling Chow! Ch-chow! Wow! Chow! His right hand, meantime, describing stately circles, for it was representing a forty-foot wheel. Let her go back on the labboard. Ting-a-ling-ling. Chow, ch chow, chow. The left hand began to describe circles. Stop the stabboard. Ting-a-ling-ling. Stop the labboard. Come ahead of the stabboard. Stop her. Let your outside turn over slow. Ting-a-ling-ling. Chow, wow, wow. Get out that headline. Lively now. Come out with your spring line. What you're about there? Take a turn round that stump with a bite of it. Stand by that stage now. Let her go. Done with the engine, sir. ting ling ling shh 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 Trying the gauge cocks. Tom went on whitewashing, paid no attention to the steamboat. Ben stared a moment and then said, hi yi you're up a stump, ain't you? No answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with the eye of an artist. Then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the result, as before. Ben ranged up alongside of him. Tom's mouth watered for the apple, but he stuck to his work. Ben said, Hello, old chap. You got work, eh? Tom wheeled suddenly and said, Why, it's you, Ben. I weren't noticing. Say, I'm going in the swimming, I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Tom contemplated the boy a bit and said, What do you call work? Why, ain't that work? Tom resumed his whitewashing and answered carelessly, Well, maybe it is and maybe it ain't. All I know is, it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come now, you don't mean to let on that you like it? The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back to note the effect, added a touch here and there, criticized the effect again, been watching every move and getting more and more interested, more and more absorbed. Presently, he said, Say, Tom, let me whitewash a little. Tom considered, was about to consent, but he altered his mind. No, no, I reckon it wouldn't hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence, right here on the street, you know. But if it was the back fence, I wouldn't mind and she wouldn't. Yeah, she's awful particular about this fence. It's got to be done very careful. I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, maybe two thousand, that can do it the way it's got to be done. No, is that so? Oh, come now. Let me just try. Only just a little. I'd let you if you was me, Tom. Ben, I'd like to. Honest Injun. But Aunt Polly, well, Jim wanted to do it, but she wouldn't let him. Sid wanted to do it, and she wouldn't let Sid. Now don't you see how I'm fixed? If you was to tackle this fence and anything was to happen to it, oh shucks, I'll be just as careful. Now let me try. Say, I'll give you the core of my apple. Well, here. No, Ben, now don't. I'm afeard I'll give you all of it. Tom gave up the brush with reluctance in his face, but alacrity in his heart. And while the late steamer Big Missouri worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by, dangled his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. There was no lack of material. Boys happened along every little while. They came to jeer, but remained to whitewash. By the time Ben was fagged out, Tom had traded the next chance to Billy Fisher for a kite, in good repair, and when he played out, Johnny Miller bought in for a dead rat and a string to swing it with, and so on and so on, hour after hour. And when the middle of the afternoon came, from being a poor, poverty-stricken boy in the morning, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. He had, besides the things before mentioned, twelve marbles, part of a juice harp, a piece of blue bottle glass to look through, a spool cannon, a key that wouldn't unlock anything, a fragment of chalk, 
a glass topper of a decanter, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, a kitten with only one eye, a brass doorknob, a dog collar but no dog, the handle of a knife, four pieces of orange peel, and a dilapidated old window sash. He had had a nice, good idle time all the while, plenty of company, and the fence had three coats of whitewash on it. If he hadn't run out of whitewash, he would have bankrupted every boy in the village. Tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it, namely, that in order to make a boy or man covet a thing, it is only necessary to make that thing difficult to attain. If he had been a great and wise philosopher, like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers or performing on a treadmill is work, while rolling ten pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger coaches twenty or thirty miles on a daily line in the summer, because the privilege costs them considerable money. But if they were offered wages for the service, that would turn it into work, and then they would resign. The boy mused a while over the substantial change which had taken place in his worldly circumstances, and then wended toward headquarters to report. In this chapter, Tom reveals his basic knowledge of human psychology. That is, a person most desires what cannot be easily attained. Tom is a fine actor and he cleverly uses this ability in handling his friends. Tom always wants what he does not have, even seeing the chores of others as preferable to his. For example, in the beginning of this chapter, Tom prefers Jim's job of fetching water to whitewashing. He realizes that he is not alone in wanting what he does not have, and manages to make his difficult chore look like a privilege to Ben Rogers. Thus, Tom is able to use this basic understanding of human nature to get others to do his work for him and to pay for the privilege of doing it. He is able to convince Ben and several other boys that it is not work to whitewash the fence. There is some truth to this, since enjoying a thing makes it more of a pleasure and less of a chore. Instead of being able to join others at the town center, Tom brings the center of the town to him, has others do his work for him, and ends up with treasures of all sorts. In this way, Twain reveals Tom as a natural leader. Throughout the novel, we will see that Tom is always the leader. It will always be Tom Sawyer's gang, it will always be his ideas of which game to play, and Tom Sawyer is always the winner in games as well as in fights with his peers. He is also usually the winner in his conflicts with the adult world. The reader is constantly reminded that this is a child's world. For example, Tom tries to make a game out of everything, Jim is fascinated by Tom's sore toe, and Ben Rogers arrives, pretending that he is a steamboat on the Missouri River. The wealth or loot that the boys offer to Tom is ludicrous, silly, and of no worth except to boys of their age. The theme is growing up. When Tom gets others to whitewash the fence, he discovers a valuable insight into human nature and why people find some things appealing and others unappealing. This is the first sign of Tom's potential adulthood. Any child would simply be happy that the work was done with no effort. Instead, Tom makes a very adult discovery showing that he has the capacity to grow. Oh, come now. You don't mean to let on that you like it? The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back to note the effect, added a touch here and there, criticized the effect again, Ben watching every move and getting more and more interested, more and more absorbed. Presently, he said, Say, Tom, let me whitewash a little. 
This interchange between Ben Rogers and Tom that occurs during the whitewashing is one of Tom's earliest exploits in the novel. The whitewashing scam gives us a thorough initial look at Tom's ingenious character. Most evident in this dialogue with Ben Rogers is Tom's consummate skill as an actor and his instinctive understanding of human behavior, that is, a person most desires what cannot be easily attained. In these moments of prankish virtuosity, Tom keeps one step ahead of his victims, anticipating their reactions and cornering them verbally into the response he desires. Work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. Most people have a negative sentiment in the work they do. They view work as a source of income, as a means of putting food on the table, roof over their heads, and purchasing all else they think are necessary. Beyond that, work is simply a requirement of living, an obligation, and a demand from the individual. Unfortunately, for some people, it can be a punishment to bear. This is not unusual. After all, work is mostly not fun. However, when we hear about people who get ahead in life, people who make success look so easy, we can find some of these great characteristics in them. One, they do great work. Two, they make others do great work. These people actually turn work from punishment to play. To make a man or a boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. Most people who don't value the work they do unconsciously feel the lack of two aspects of valuable work. One, the work that they are doing is not difficult enough to challenge them constantly. Two, the work that they are doing is not important enough for them to want to take on the challenge. The moral with which Twain concludes this amusing chapter is work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do and play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. The arbitrariness of many conventions and the absurdity with which people desire things just because they are forbidden are facts of life. And that is what Twain scrutinizes again and again in this chapter. This chapter reveals levels of intelligence and ingenuity that will serve Tom well in this novel. Tom has precisely the right traits that will set him up for an interesting adventure.